Good morning, church. We're glad you're here. Let's go to worship and stand. Arise, shine, for the light is come. Arise, shine, for the light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen. The glory of the Lord is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon Sophie keeps me 
honest, she knows her rules, and she reminds me of them. She's my go-to gal, and she's only five. I told you I've worked with great ones. So, now please uh, turn your attention to some announcements. Um, our potluck luncheon is next Sunday after church in the gym, so call the office to RSVP. There's time to still to donate uh, supplies and monetary donations for Ukraine, so please get that in as well. If you have items for the midweek message or prayer request, uh, they must <coughs> excuse me, be emailed to Sharon or Shalene by Tuesday. Ladies' class is meeting this Tuesday at 10 in the rotunda. Wednesday morning is senior adult breakfast and devotional in the senior room at 8.30. And prayer night is Wednesday in the rotunda at 6.30. Movie day with lunch is Thursday at 11.30 in the senior room. And we've heard from Arms of Hope, and they want to extend their gratitude to us for their for our help with their Easter baskets. So thank you for your kind generosity towards that project. And also, um, please keep the light of family in your prayers and thoughts this week as they begin to figure out a new normal after the loss of Jill. So now as we turn our minds towards worship, please hear these words from Psalm 89, 1 and 2. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever. That you establish your faithfulness from heaven itself. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we are grateful that we are your people and that you love us and are faithful to each of us. We are in deep need of you, and we come to you empty-handed. We have nothing to offer, but you delight in us anyway. We are blessed and grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lord, we come before thee now.
stand. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. The economy just did a reversal, 
And people that were at one time very, very wealthy now were on, on the edge of poverty. So they lost everything. It's like you woke up one morning and uh, your land is worthless and your 401k is gone, everything's, the bottom fell out. And so people that were accustomed to living very, very well were now presented with the problem of how am I going to support my lifestyle? And they turned to a lot, a lot of crime. And so as, as Paul and Titus enter this culture, they're trying to establish uh, a New Testament Christianity in a culture that is very, um, uh, very criminal-based, uh, very macho, uh, very, very um, uh, corrupt. And, and the, whole, the whole, at this point in time, referring to someone as a Cretan, uh, meant you were talking to someone who was dishonest, who was brutal, who was violent, who was a liar. The very word Cretan was considered to be something that was anathema. Does that make sense? And so we have this little two-page letter in there where Paul is writing back to Titus saying, this is, here's some things I need you to do. Paul had been in prison in Rome. Uh, he gets out of prison in about 61 AD. He and Titus go to Crete and they establish the church. Paul leaves, sends Titus back there. And about three or four years later, so 63, 64, he writes this little letter back. So these are very young churches, very new people in the faith. And he writes some instructions to Titus on how to put a church into a very, very difficult culture. So that's where we are. Last week, the first lesson, we said that Titus was given a formula. And the formula in the book is the first paragraph, verses 1 to 4. And that is, people that are in a difficult situation need some hope. Remember that? And hope is based upon two things, faith and good information. So that was the work we did last week. So we're caught up. On a college professor, we have to do a review before we get into the material for today. So are we all caught up? Everybody remember all this? There'll be a pop quiz next week, okay? Here we go on this. So we're going to pick up then with his second piece of instructions to the church in the church uh, there on Crete. And we pick up in chapter 1 and verse 5. We're going to go through. Um, five through nine, and, and we'll look at a very famous reading. Many of you know this. You've heard it your whole life. It is his instructions regarding the establishment of elders on Crete. So Titus 1, verses 5 through 9. Paul writes, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. We'll come back to that construction in just a second. An elder must be blameless. The husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, who's upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Now, when I was growing up in the church, um, grew up over at White Rock in Dallas, and it was time to appoint elders, uh, the church bulletin would run the two lists. Y'all remember that? So there'd be a list of the elders from 1 Timothy 3, ding, 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 ding. And then there'd be a list of the elders' qualifications from Titus chapter 1, ding, 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 ding. And we'd read through those in the church bulletin, and we'd go, well, there's nobody that's going to match up all of this, so we're going to look for it in, 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 in second place, you know, so we don't want to be able to do this deal. And that's okay, and that's an appropriate way to approach that. But I'm going to suggest to you this morning that there's a little bit different take on this when we look at kind of the original language and how Paul was writing this. If you look at your text, if you don't have it, I'll just read it. If you look at your text in verse 6, he uses the word blameless. He says, an elder must be blameless. 
And then in verse 7, he's going to say once again, he said, he must be blameless. I'm going to suggest to you this morning, and all those characteristics are correct. They're all in there. We need to pay attention to them. On the island of Crete, at this moment in time, there's one thing that's foremost in Paul's mind. There's basically one characteristic for an elder on Crete. And that's, guess what? Blameless. Blameless. Everything else around that is a descriptor of blameless. Very, very interesting. In other words, he's writing to Titus and he's saying, I need you to find some guys on the island of Crete that don't have any skeletons in their closet. They're not felons. They don't have a criminal record. They're not going to get appointed elder and all of these stories are going to come out in the newspaper that they're guilty of this and this and this and this and this. And this. It, would be, it would be like me saying, uh, Mark has a great sense of humor. And then I get the characteristics of that. Well, he tells good stories. He makes me laugh every time I get together. When I'm in a bad mood, I call him. He, 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 he elevates my spirit. All of those are descriptors of he's got a great what? Great sense of humor. That's the construction here. That's how difficult Titus's job was on Crete. Trying to find a guy who did not have any skeletons in his closet it was going to be a tough deal. Does that make sense? So then let's look at the let's look at the descriptors. So he says in verse 6, an elder must be blameless. Okay, the first one is the husband of one wife. Let's pause on that one for just a second. On the island of Crete, it was assumed that you were going to have your formal family, your wife and your kids, but then you were going to have women on the side. They had affairs, and that was a part of that culture. And it's a part of many cultures. A number of years ago, a missionary in Caracas had me come down to Venezuela, and I did a marriage enrichment seminar down there. And so I'm up in front of an audience about like this, and I'm working for two days, and there's a translator there, and I'm doing all my marriage and family stuff, yada, 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 yada. and it's going out in Spanish, and I have no idea what's being said because I don't speak the language, and da, 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 da. So when I get through, and I think I've done this great job, all these hands go up. And it was, it was all women's hands, and just about everyone in the audience. And all the women had the same question. And the question was, okay, I understand how I'm supposed to get along with my husband that you've been talking about, but what do I do with my husband's other wife and family? And I was like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't really covered that one often in marriage and enrichment stuff. But it was a part of the culture. And so what Paul's saying here to Titus is, I need you to find a guy who is faithful to his wife and doesn't have a bunch of skeletons in the closet relating to his marriage. Make sense? So he, he picks up again. He says, a husband of wife, not a man whose children believe are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So Paul is establishing a church on an island where the families were disintegrated. And the kids took the brunt of that. We talked about this last week. If you were a kid growing up on Crete, your dad was out pirating on the high seas. It was basically matriarchal families. And the mothers had multiple children and many times could not support the families. So what they do is they sell the children, primarily the boys, into mercenary camps up in the mountains. And so as a kid, young teenager, you never knew when you went to bed, if the bedroom door were going to burst open some night and a couple of soldiers were going to come in and drag you off into the mountains and, and train you to be in some foreign army. So the kids took the brunt of it. No one valued uh, the helpless. So he's saying, you need, to find, you need to find a guy who knows how to be a dad. So he continues. He says... Not open is entrusted with God's work. He must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick tempered, not drunken, not violent. We'll stop with those. These were men that solved their problems with their fists. This was a macho culture. And he's saying, I need you to look for some guys who, when there's a conflict, they can sit down and they can have a conversation with somebody without going off the rails. 
someone who's not given to violence. And that was very foreign in this culture. And then he says, you need to find someone who's not pursuing dishonest gain. Someone who is not concocting criminal activity. Someone who has a job, brings home a paycheck, does the basic deal. So then he picks up and he says, he goes positive. So he's been negative so far, then he goes positive. He says, someone who is hospitable. In other words, someone who's going to invite you home to dinner or let's have a cup of coffee and sit down and make friends with you. He must be hospitable, who loves what is good, who's self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that's been taught so he can encourage others and then refute those who oppose it. Someone who's teachable. He said, you're looking for a guy, because these are young Christians. Very interesting. He's appointing elders who were probably five years under in the faith. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's, that's pretty remarkable. He's looking for a needle in a haystack here. So he's saying, I need you to find somebody who's been listening to your preaching, can then teach it to other people, and then he says, can refute false teaching. So in other words, someone who can conduct debates, who can refute some of these Jewish teachers that they're dealing with. Hard to find a guy like that? Yeah, this is going to be a remarkable undertaking. Titus, Titus is looking for some really, really unique guys. So, we'll pause there and let's make some applications. I'm going, to, I'm going to change gears. We've been talking Greek and history and all this other stuff. And one of the challenges of, especially preaching here at Skillman, is because I know I'm preaching to a lot of elders and former elders and people who've done a remarkable job in church leadership. And a lot of people could preach this lesson a lot better than I could. But as I was reflecting on this, it occurred to me that there's, at least for me, there's several applications to this coming out of Titus related to leadership in the Lord's church. One of those is leadership out of Titus and Timothy, we understand is situational. It's situational. In other words, what worked on the island of Crete might not work as an elder someplace else. Now, we've all intuitively known that, but we didn't know it was biblical. And, and, and I think I can prove that to you. If you, look at, if you look at Titus, he's saying, for instance, I, we're looking for a guy who is an elder who is not pursuing dishonest what? Gain. Okay, so he's not out there running felonies and, and running gambling casinos and he's out there running drugs and alcohol. We, we got that. Turn over if you've got your Bibles to 1 Timothy with me, the other pastoral epistle. 1 Timothy 3 and um, let's look at this let's look at this one for just a second. He says Yeah, he says, elder self-controlled, I'm in verse uh, 2. Self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, now in verse 3. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. And then he says, not a lover of what? Money. Not a lover of money. Is that the same as what's in Titus or different from what's in Titus? It's different, isn't it? In, in, in Titus, he's not saying not pursuing what? dishonest gain. He's not a criminal. In Timothy, he's saying, not a lover of money. That's different, isn't it? Why? Because Timothy is in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus was different from the church on Crete. The church in Ephesus was kind of like more balanced. It was a woman. It was successful. It was filled with a bunch of businessmen who were making big incomes and holding down jobs and running companies and this, that, and the other. And in the original Greek, when he says, not a lover of money, he's saying to Timothy in Ephesus, appoint a guy who is not so busy making money that he doesn't have time to shepherd the church. A little bit different, not a lover of money. In Crete, he's saying, find a guy who's not pursuing dishonest gain. He's not a felon, and that's going to come out once he's an elder. 
So what we understand then is an elder in Ephesus probably wouldn't have survived on Crete. They'd have eaten his lunch. And an elder on Crete would probably not have been appropriate in Ephesus. Different situation, right? So there is an aspect. We've always, we've always known that. We've always known that. Elders in one spot would may be perfect for that spot and may not be equipped for another one. And that's okay. Because Timothy and Titus got different instructions. So there's a situational aspect to this thing. It's very, very interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. A second part about leadership that's very, very interesting coming out of this is the ideas I'm looking at this week. The leadership really sets the tone for the congregation. It sets the tone for, for every human system. The, the leadership nucleus in a family, the husband and wife sets the tone for the family. Over in my university, the leadership sets the tone for the university. At the counseling center that I work at, the leadership sets the tone. And in the church, the leadership sets the tone for that. It's, it's where, it, and that's what Paul was telling Titus so far. You're looking for some guys that are going to promote unity, love, that are going to teach, that are going to defend the church. They're going to set the tone for that. I had a chance about 15 plus years ago to transition to church up in Amarillo, and I met three of the most remarkable elders up there, Larry Brown, Mel Brunson, and Doug Conger. And Larry ran a big real estate operation in Amarillo. Um, Mel was plumbing supply, blue collar, um, just a great guy, and then Doug, CPA, and had had a practice in Amarillo and a big clients down here in Dallas, working two towns. They had been a part of the leadership team that had started uh, Southside in Amarillo. So they started that church, a traditional mainline church of Christ, and, and were a part of that and led that, were elders of that. They looked at Amarillo years later and realized Amarillo needed a community church. And so they were just spunky enough that they went out and they planted a new church. And that church just grew and grew and grew and it became a 3,000 member church and it had a service on Saturday night and two on Sunday morning. And they went into transition and called me and I worked with them for about a year, year and a half and helped that church at that point in time. Second church. Then they decided Amarillo needs an inner city ministry church. And they looked around and said, well, I, I believe we'll do that. So they planted and started and eldered their third church and started an inner city ministry, ministry church called Cross Point. And these guys just decided, we're going to do something that sets the tone for this community. And you, it, they were just remarkable guys. And just, just set the tone in such a beautiful way. You pull in Canaveral South and parked the car, and it was very likely that Larry Brown or, or Mel Brunson would meet you at your car with a worship order, would meet you, or if you were a member there, would know your name out of 3,000 people. Never seen anything like it. But they just understood what it meant for a leader to set the tone and be in touch with their people. And I just love that so very, very much. So leadership is about setting that spiritual tone with the church. A third one that struck me this week is related to setting boundaries. Setting boundaries. Were these new elders on Crete going to need to say, folks, okay, this is appropriate behavior and this is not appropriate behavior. This is the way we're going to have to act around here. Yeah, because they had a lot of people there on Crete that weren't going to know how to be church folk. Uh, they weren't going to know how to behave at the potluck. <laughs> going to be bringing a crown in and pouring some hard liquor and, you know, misbehaving. Okay, not knowing what to do here. <clears throat> the old guard sets the boundaries. Gray hair can tell young bucks, this is how we're going to behave and how we're not going to behave. And that needs to happen. Does that make sense? And that's a really good thing. 
Paul said it this way. He said, guard the flock to which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. In other words, he's saying that the gray hair looks at the younger flock and says, this is how we're going to act. I was at a fraternity breakfast at homecoming out of ACU just a couple of years ago. And they bring in all the club, and we're there at 6.30 in the morning, we're drinking our coffee, we're eating our donuts, and I'm at the back with all the guys that I was in club with back in you know, the late 70s. And we're about half asleep, and the rest of the club's up there, and they got the pledges up there, and they're doing the skip, and they're, you know, acting stupid and all this other stuff. And we're half asleep, and it's way too early to be doing this sort of thing. And about halfway through this presentation by the club things, some of the pledges led off with a joke that was completely inappropriate and then some language that was way off base. And, I mean, you could see all of us at the back kind of straighten up and look at each other and went, okay, we didn't just hear that, did we? And then we got very quiet. It went a little bit longer and it happened a second time. And Mojo Lewis from Houston and Flint Gaines and me and a couple of the other guys we all look at each other like, are you going to handle this or am I going to handle this? Because we ain't doing this again. And Flint goes walking down forward, and he's big barrel chested, meat hook arms. And he's walking down like this, and he grabs him by the nap of the neck, shakes him a couple of times, and says, Look, we don't talk and act this way. And if you do it again, I'm going to chain you to the back of my pickup and haul you to Albany. I mean, we're not going to act this way. Now go back to doing what you were doing before. He slapped them around a little bit. Good thing or bad thing? Good thing. Gray hair puts the young bucks in its place and says, this is how we're going to act. I'm sorry I've gone to meddling here, but that's something our culture needs an awful lot of right now. I have to hand out every semester Dr. Don's Ten Commandments to my graduate students to tell them how we behave in class. It's like CDC all over again. <laughs> okay. I'll get off and move on. Last point, which is leadership drives change. The elders on Crete are going to have to drive a cultural change. Things are going to have to be different. Very, very different. And that was a good thing. Um, growing up, I grew up in the household of two elders. My father was an elder for 25 years. My uncle was an elder uh, for I don't know how long. My uncle Roy Willingham was a doctor in Abilene. And he founded Hendrick Medical Center, the big hospital there. He was chairman of the board at ACC and became ACU chairman of the board of trustees there for many, many years. And he was an elder uh, at the university church. Phenomenal man. I, I grew up in their living room. And everyone in town, he was everybody's doctor. And he fought the battles with ACC with John Stevens for years. And he grew the university church. And in their living room, his phone would just ring 24 hours a day with people with some sort of need. And he had the greatest sense of humor and the greatest just ability to make people at ease. And he was a remarkable Renaissance man. You'd go over and visit with him. He'd go to the Holy Land and find these, these oil lamps. And he had this whole collection of oil lamps from New Testament times that were on display in a museum. And he collected flint, he collected flintlock muskets from the Civil War. And he'd bring out a musket. You know, he was going to get shot or get lit up in a lamp. You know, he was just this remarkable individual. When I was in graduate school, I got to just camp out in their living room as a young man getting ready for ministry. And the thing that was so remarkable about Uncle Roy was at that point in time, in the late 60s and in the 70s, we as a movement were kind of discovering grace. Do you all remember that? My dad 
was very legalistic. He was, he was just a very conservative man, and I loved him to death, but he was very legalistic. My Uncle Roy, we would sit down, he would sit me down, I was 20, 21 years old, and he would begin having these remarkable discussions with me about God's grace and about the book of Romans and Galatians and about how maybe our theology as a movement was not where it needed to be. And he was just going inside that little brain that was growing and he was doing some rewiring there. And he very quietly, very powerfully, very consistently, in his own way, moved his circle of influence toward grace. Good thing or bad thing? And I'm just so grateful for those conversations that he put into me. We're so blessed with the elders that I get to work with here in this transition. Ken and Shane have just done a great job in this transition. They've let somebody in from the outside to be a consultant. Folks, churches generally don't do that. I would talk to churches as a consultant, and most of the time I have an opening conversation, they shut the door, and that's the end of it. Because they don't want anybody mucking with them from the outside. They got all the answers. These guys have said, we're going to walk with you through this transition. They have an incredible work ethic. These guys just work themselves to death to make sure we have a Sunday morning worship service. I pulled into the funeral service yesterday, and Ken's out there helping cars get parked. That's elderly. Just remarkable. We're so blessed. I got to preach my Uncle Roy's funeral service. I'm going to try and get through this. The auditorium of the university church was absolutely filled. Ground floor and balcony. Priest of service. We get through and we go outside for the lineup to head to the cemetery. And in retirement, he became the director of hospice care for the city of Abilene. He became the director of medical care for the police department, the fire department. He used to tell me I'm busier in retirement than I was when I was in practice full time. People keep bringing me jobs. We go out and we get into the family limousine and we're headed out to the cemetery and the boulevards are lined with fire trucks, police vehicles, the fire trucks are spurting the water that they do to honor somebody to drive through. And there's just a lineup of cars for miles and just people from Abilene just paying their respects. Just saying, Dr. Roy was somebody that cared about me. He'd become an elder to the whole city in a very quiet way. Paul writes to Titus a few years in Crete and he says, you're looking for a needle in the haystack, but when you find that guy, he will be able to turn this island up sun. Let's pray. Father, oh, we're so blessed by people who have come into our lives, who has led us in powerful ways. 
people that we look back on, that your spirit was a part of, that have changed us remarkably. And we're so grateful for those people. We pray for young people that are coming up, that we can instill in them the spirit that's transformational, that turn them into the kind of leaders that they need to be. Help us, Father, to realize that whoever we are, we have an influence on people. There are people watching us and watching how we conduct ourselves. And, and, and we're, we're impacting people with everything we say and do. And this church is as well. That Skillman is impacting people and is being a witness here in this community. And help us, Father, to see the opportunities that that gives us. We pray these things through your Son and all God's people say it. Let's stand. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or
put on the door frames. It was a time when they escaped death and slavery, slavery through the intervention of God, and they received freedom from being slaves in Egypt. Likewise, Christ is our Passover lamb, unblemished and perfect in all of his ways. In whom no sin was found, through him we receive freedom from being a slave to sin, to fear, to doubt, to sickness, to low self-esteem or self-worth. And meanwhile, receiving forgiveness for our sake, he paid the ultimate price on the cross. Because of Christ's death on the cross, we are no longer slaves, but sons and daughters of the living God. Because of his death on the cross, we are victorious in Christ Jesus. By his death, he has freed us from being a slave to sin and given us a spirit of sonship. Therefore, we must always walk in victory because our sins have been forgiven. And Satan, who is the accuser, has been disarmed and defeated on the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15 says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it all away by, by, excuse me, by being nailed to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Satan can no longer accuse you before the Father. As the Word of God says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You are victorious in Christ. By disarming Satan, Christ rescued us while we were enslaved to sin, and instead put us in the spirit of sonship. The separation that once existed between God and man has now been closed by the cross on which Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice. Let us remember today that because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are more than conquerors. He has brought us to victory already. That is why the Word of God says that we are more than conquerors, for the victory has already been achieved. So when you partake of the bread and drink from the cup today, please remember that because of his broken body and the blood that he spilled, that he split, spilled for you. Recognize who you are in Christ, that you are sons and daughters of God. Remember also that you are already in a place of victory, that you are seated in heavenly places. And lastly, continue to build your personal relationship with him, not just to know him, but to know him personally, to know his person and to his experience his presence. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us this gift of life. We thank you, Lord, for our health and for our families. We thank you, Lord, for our friends and, and for everyone in this church today that's gathered to worship you and to learn more about you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice um, that you provided, Lord, with your son Jesus dying on the cross for us and, and rising again. And thank you, Lord, for the everlasting life that, that we have through your son's death. And we thank you, Lord, for the many uh, lessons that we've learned uh, as a result of uh, your son Jesus and the way that he walked through this world. We just pray, Lord, that you continue to, to bless this church. And uh, we thank you again, Lord, for the examples that you've given us in your word uh, for, for taking communion this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
praise worship through these words again from Psalm 89, 5 and 6. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assemblies of the holy ones. For those in the, for who in the skies above can compare to the Lord? Who is like the Lord among heavenly beings? Would you pray with me, please? Lord, as we depart this place, remind us of your majesty, your power, and your faithfulness to each of us. Make us strong and courageous. Make us your lights in a dark world. We love you and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.